You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Beat everyone in the country for like three, four years in a row. And I never got sent to one of the, you know, like one of the majors. Yeah. I never got sent to the Europeans, never got sent to the Worlds. And they always just pick some bullshit excuse. My style wouldn't work. And then I'd beat the kid that they sent. And then the next year, I'd beat the kid that they sent. Happened times in a row. I didn't win my world title and start thinking about how am I going to be the next? Or how am I going to get my name to this? Nah, I was back in the gym, sparring a week later, a week and a half later. Training, and fight date, training, fight date, training. Like, I've got a legacy and a level of greatness that I want to achieve in this sport that I will only achieve it by dedicating every time I can in the gym. I fought seven times, back, 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 in 14 month period, and I had two months off, <clears throat> injured. All on TV, all title fights against any, the first opponent they said every single time. Because I was hell bent, that I'm not going out like the rest of these losers. If I'm honest, like they just say no to fights and then when they eventually get beat, no one cares about them. The things they tell me I can't because it's mad. Like if you ask me, Sonny, go up to Bantamweight in your next fight and fight any of the world champions on a random hat, I'd say yeah. And I think I could beat them, even the scary ones. Even the ones that, no, you couldn't beat them, you couldn't even get the ring of them. Because trust me, I've sparred and fought many a scary people that when they get in the ring aren't, aren't as scary no more. Yeah, when he said that about my address and he said that if I'm not there between 11 and 12, whatever he said, he's going to walk the whole of Sheffield screaming Sonny Edwards is a coward, yeah? Like, what am I actually supposed to do at this point? Am I just supposed to, like, ignore it? Am I just meant to block him? Like, someone has physically shown that they are willing to travel four hours from London to Sheffield to see me, like, I might as well deal with this now. Boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got world champion boxer, yeah. Sonny Edwards. How are you, bro? Yeah, all good, James. All good. Thanks for having me down. Good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. Flying high in life, bro. World champion, smashing it. Not only world champion boxer, but I believe world champion shit stirrer, mate. You are everywhere, mate, causing it online, offline. But the main thing is you're causing it in the boxing ring, so fair play. How are you feeling with it all? Yeah, good. Good, really good. I mean, as far as life, boxing career, I think 26 years old, I'm sort of living the dream that I set out to a long time ago. I, um, you know, I've never done anything else. I've never clocked in for work. I went to uni. I dropped out after my second year, um, moved to Spain, turned pro and then never looked back. Um, I realised that working kids wasn't the backup plan that I thought it was <laughs> going to be, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I just, I chose to sort of follow the dream and sort of against a lot of people's, um, I don't know, advice maybe. The time when I turned the age, I turned pro and sort of jumping out of uni, a lot of people sort of had a lot of things to say. Um, but yeah, kind of all worked out better than I probably could hope for so far. Yeah, fair play. I always go back to the start of my guests, where you grew up, how it all began. Um, I grew up South London. Um, Bedderton uh, is like probably the, my main stomping ground. I um, I was born in Sutton, uh, St. Hilio Hospital. I spent my first years, Radcliffe Gardens Council Estate. Um, went to the school right next to it, Barrow Hedges. Moved into um, a an undesirable house, a location of a house. It was like an industrial unit on Bedderton Lane in... in in Mitcham, Croydon. Um, yeah, it was, it was a decent house, but I mean, there was sewage plants about half a mile that way, so it smelled all year yeah. round. You know what I mean? But yeah, that was my upbringing. We we had it okay. Didn't have didn't have the roughest. Um, seen some hard times, you know. Seen seen the, the breakups and all of that. But um, yeah, for the most part, I think I was a boxer for a long period of my childhood. From nine, I started. From about. 11 to 14, was doing it a little bit more, then had a break, and then from 14 to, well, now really I've been Non-stop. pretty much a full-time athlete, if I'm honest. How were you at school? I did good. I was, um, like, primary school times, I was very, comp I'm a competitive person, but I, ca I can only find things that, one, I'm good at, I like competing at things I'm good at, and two, like, I, li I like dedicating one thing at a time. So when I was young, I'm talking 10, 11, I'm, to I'm top of the class. Um, top of the year, like I was one of the smartest kids. I went to a grammar school. Um, was one of the top on entry. First couple of years, I'm top ten in the year of the the graded exams at the end. 
like Wallington County Grammar School, very good school. At the time it was top five, top 10 in the country for, for whatever the, I don't know how to even state, whatever the, the schools are called. Um, good education, went, um, did GCSEs, got good grades, one A star, seven A's, two B's, two C's, got A levels, B, C, C. Um, went to university, Sheffield Hallam. Um, what did you do? I did sports studies. Um, really, like, I did best in that stuff like hi history and English. Um, I've always been good at arguing. I've always been good at... Uh, <laughs> I waff think we've sussed that out now. Waffling bro. as well. Like, presentation, cap like, trying to keep uh, an audience captured even in the times that you're forgetting what you're saying and stuff like that. I've always been quite good at that sort of freestyling. Gift of the gab, some people may say. But, um, yeah, I did sports studies. Um, it was mainly just for the uni thing. I'll be real. I think 90% of the kids that I went to school with go to university. I think 30, 40% or more was Russell Group Uni. So, like, I went, I was with, uh, you know, quite an intelligent bunch coming through school. Um, it was a boys' school till sick form, then it's mixed. Uh, but, yeah, at sports, it was, like, my, my backup plan for, like, going to, like, maybe be the PE teacher. I realised after a year of coaching lads in the Steel City gym, like, the little 5 to 10, 11-year-olds, there's no way I'm working with kids. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Now I've got two of my own, and yeah, I can bet I can. I know why it's so funny now that I even thought to work with kids. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, Fucking hard work, mate, isn't it? Oh, terribly hard work. Do you have a big family? Nah, um, numbers wise, probably not the like the smallest, not the biggest, but we had quite an isolated um, upbringing in like the sense of my family unit was like, yeah, we, we weren't really too close with cousins, we weren't really too close with the other branch of the family, just, you know, things happen in families and things that I weren't even around for before my time, people that I'd not even met, that sort of, you know, split families apart as they do. Yeah, with so, the politics. Yeah, all the fucking just horrible, evil people living amongst normal people and then ruining people's lives. I think, you know, stuff like that. Nothing on my immediate family, nothing on my side. I was, you know, for the most part, okay, we had certain upbringings with we had like a sergeant major as a dad and then the, the easiest mum in the world it was like a mad balance um yeah but we was kept mate we was, we was especially me and my brother we was kept away from trauma for the most part we was kept away from you know any sort of unstable life we had we had it good really do you think that's helped you now deal Death. with a lot of things um I don't know, in what sense of deal like the attention you're getting the online stuff, everything that comes with doing well for yourself. Um, <clears throat> I don't know about that. I'd like, I'd, because with me, I think I grew up with a phone in my hand, a, a computer. Um, I was on before Twitter and Instagram was a thing. I'm having arguments with the the boxing scene on Warrior Boxing forums ten, fifteen years ago as a kid. And so I would, I, I probably was always gonna have a a troll side of me, my mm. person, because. I've got a lot of opinions. Um, you know, I've probably got some sort of like personality things where I like doo -doo 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 -doo, I, I like keeping my mind um, captivated by something. It works fast. It, you know, it, it's not like, a, it's no stress to me when I'm having sort of a back yeah. and forth or a buzz. If anything, it's some mild entertainment, to be honest. Because a lot of people do it through frustration, ego, anger. Like it can drain you. But like I went back and forth, back and I don't mind a bit of back and forth, but then I go, fuck this, I just step back. And then they make it, because a part of you thinks they've won then. I don't feel as if you stop. Nah, never. Do you know what I mean? And that doesn't drain you at any point. Do you know why? Because my good friend, the McCormack twins, they, they told me this and it stuck with me years ago. And even though them two are mad, they say some profound things, right? And they went, it's not how funny you are, it's how far you're willing to go. Um, and that kind of stuck with me, that did. And it kind of makes their whole personality make a lot more sense. But like, I'm I've got the legs. On when it comes to like social media back and forth, I literally train for one two hours a day, and I'm on my backside if I want to be. I don't have to do anything until the next day. Where I probably argue with someone that's got like a nine to five. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, all three kids in the house, and you're getting asked to put the bins out. Like, I'm a part time dad when I'm in camp. You know what I mean? So you're probably fighting a losing battle, and. I don't know, do you know what it is more than anything? I just don't like I genuinely don't get offended by things. Like I'm I'm a, uh, I'm an incredibly per hard person to offend because outside of something pulling at my heartstrings, nothing actually like affects me. Like if it's someone saying something to me, like I grew up like the school I, I grew up in, so, so Wallington. 
okay, it might not have been the worst for fighting. Obviously, there was fights and that, but like the kids were more probably civilized than maybe in some schools that was around us, right? But one thing that wasn't was everyone's mouths because now you're in the middle of 130 each year, proper quick-witted individuals that know how to use their mouth to make your feelings hurt. So obviously, I'm small, I'm, I'm goofy. I'm, I, was, I, was, I was like a 14-year-old kid, probably looked about 10 or 11. Like I, thought I was always like maybe underdeveloped, catching up late, whatever. Um, so I heard it all. I heard it all growing up, you know what I mean? So, And I liked it really more than anything. Like I liked the back and forth and it's just sort of, carried on now that's made you more thick skinned I don't even think it's thick skinned because like like do you know if someone gets me I'll laugh like or if someone does something really like do you know if like someone snapped like I've had examples where people have like posted a picture of my mum or done something about my mum and then like even like reputable people like this, we'll talk about this real like this example like when Curtis Woodhouse me and him are going back and forth yeah no Curtis I got him so angry yeah that eventually he posted something about my mum and deleted him in three minutes and lost like 10 clients of his It Starts Monday thing. And now me and Curtis, since like, for me, it's all laugh, it's all back and forth. As soon as I seen it, I just went, got him. Do you know what I mean? Because like, his head's gone. Do you know what I mean? Like, so I didn't get offended. If anything, that just kind of like cemented what I already knew was happening. Do you know what I mean? Your head is all over the place. Um, but like, it just is what it is because there's nothing I could read or see that will penetrate my like my my motion needle i guess like it's just it's just all external nonsense that okay it can be positive it can be negative but like that's always gonna let other people have the the last say on what your mood is like and and, and then the internet is so like you can put the phone and put down like that genuinely couldn't like and and, and my life experience is that anyone anytime anyone ever sees me and they get onto me for being sunny edge with the boxer it's always pleasant i've never had one not one remotely negative apart from them being a bit too much or wanting to chat to you too much or being off their face in a club and put their arm around, uh, arm around you and putting your headlock and that. Yeah. Like, but it's always out of a place of love and, and respect. So I don't, like, I don't feel or, or, you know, hear the disrespect or the things that you see online, which you see every, I see every single day, but not once the way. Yeah, how's the relationship with you and Cutlers now? Yeah, it sounds. I think every now and then he tries to have a little buzz in that, but... Like he's never personal. He just started tweeting me, and I, and like like we had before. If someone tweets me, I tweet back. Like I, very rarely, very rarely you'll you'll see something kick off from me. Sunny Edwards has targeted, started this, and like at Sunny Edwards, you know what I mean? It's yeah. it's usually and and I quote retweet everything. And the reason why I quote retweet everything is because I want you to know exactly why I've just said what I've just said. And when you do that replies, and that it can start getting a bit confusing. I want them to see that like, this is what they said, and this is what I'm saying back to it. But apart from that, like, like I don't care. Like, it's just, I've got way too much time on my hands, I think, is more. How was your mum and dad growing up? Yeah. together? For a part. For a part, I think, um, for the first 11 years, they were, I mean, them being together, I don't know if that necessarily, like, consists of a happy relationship, you know what I mean? I think from the last few years before they separated, I'd say, and my mum left, um, they were sleeping in separate bedrooms and that, you know what I mean? Just arguing all the time. Well, just, not even arguing at this point. I mean, the, the conversation is always a shout, you know what I mean? It's just, my dad would come home from work, not come home from work, come home from dropping us to school, would make sure he put all the mud in the in the 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 the, the, uh, the, the hallway, would go and make breakfast, make sure there's all as many breadcrumbs spread across and every utensil he could have possibly, like, genuinely, like, so petty, because my mum's a clean freak, so she'd come down and clean all. Every single time, it was like it was, it was mad. How they were together for so long is probably um, more surprising. But yeah, at 11, first day of school actually, first day of secondary school, um, the World Cup, and yeah, they weren't in the house that was last week. You know what I mean? My mum left, and I was with my dad for a few years. Did that affect you? At any point? Um, at the time, I didn't think so. In conversations with family members, I'm the baby, obviously, so. Like, I guess hindsight is lost a bit more on the baby because you're not looking down on anyone, do you know what I mean? Um, but, yeah, I think I went in myself a lot more. I became a lot more, you know... Um, my dad was very different. So losing the soft touch in the house, my brother kind of found every excuse not to be in the house, probably basically moved out when he was 15. Anytime he had a girlfriend, he was on GB apart from that, do you know what I mean? So... It was just me and my dad, and I just learned very early just the safest space was 
as far away from my dad as possible. From for for a long period of my life, he was basically a boxing trainer. Do you think that's why you went to boxing so much at that age, just to kind of escape? Nah, because I started at nine. Um, so you I, started before it happened. Yeah, so I started at nine. They broke up when I was eleven. At fourteen, I moved out of my dad's and lived with my mum on my own back. Just decided that that's what I was doing one day. Did it. Then seven months I quit boxing, got fat. Why? Um, I think I lost. So I liked boxing, loved fighting, loved sparring, hated training. I was just I was just lazy. I just like. I didn't want to train. I didn't feel the need to train because I, I wouldn't train. I'd still beat people. Like I won most of my fights and I didn't really try hard, but I just didn't like doing the things I didn't like doing. Then I lost in two schoolboy finals, probably should have won close fights. But to me, that was heartbreaking. My brother had already won them. Like He was like my benchmark. He's always been the heels that I've always been chasing. Do you know what I mean? My dad set us in a very competitive environment. Everything was... Do you know what I mean? Win, not lose. Do you know what I mean? Everything was against each other um, from young. So I stopped boxing for seven months. And then at the age of 14, at the age of 14, yeah. So I stopped boxing and moved with my mum. And now I had freedom. I had, I was allowed out sometimes if it permitted. I'm talking, I'm still going house parties at 13, 14. And my dad wants to speak to parents on the, on the phone. Mm -hmm. like that, that was the level he's dropping me there and he's picking me up. Like... My dad feared the world. He, he wanted to keep us safe. So I, I can hear that now as a father. Strict. Yeah, yeah, strict. Accounted for. All the time accounted for. We weren't we weren't out wandering. Um, but <laughs> moving my mum, she had me down as a sensible kid. And to be fair, I never brought police. I never brought trouble back to her. I never really got in any these things. But obviously it was out being a little bastard. Do you know what I mean? You could pull the wheel over your mum's oh, eyes. Oh, no. From, from, so from 14, um, I, moved to, I moved to South Korea and lived with my mum. And then for the next seven months, I spent... Like I'm talking coming home at two o'clock in the morning when I got school, wasn't it? Like I'm sort of like chasing around girls and I lost my virginity these times. You know, like it was like, it was good. It was like seven months of freedom <laughs> that I'd never had. Yeah. Seven months of freedom that I'd never had. I could kind of do what I wanted. And I would always, I, like, I love my mom. I didn't need to lie to my mom. Like she was so soft that like it, it was easy for me to do what I was doing and be honest with what I was doing for the most part. So, um, but after seven months, I remember the end of summer came. And I was just bored. Like I remember at the end of at the end of uh, the school year, yeah. Normally there's always you know, like athletics, cross country, yeah, and sports too. Just from being a boxer, no running training ever. I was the best at cross country. I was the best at fifteen hundred meters. I was the best at eight hundred meters. Like throughout my whole school life. But in this one time, I came second in the school, which was like unheard of, like in my year at fifteen hundred meters. And then I went to the borough one and came last. Like out of eight people, but like the borough one. I'm normally I'm good. That's why I was there because every other year I'm good. Yeah, little fat kid. <laughs> like, and from that moment, I remember coming last and that making out. I pulled a fucking leg. That's why I was so slow and I was just terribly unfit. Didn't like, but in my head, I thought I was still gonna be able to run the same. Do you know what I mean? Like, I thought seven months off playing a few rugby matches, not going boxing, not running. I thought I'd still be able to run the same in my head for some reason and. When that happened, I was deeply embarrassed. Even though I weren't boxing, I was, I was embarrassed. Um, I decided I'm gonna have a few more weeks, sort of just chilling off over summer, like when summer came. And then for the next year, I wanted to get back into it. So I pretty much hired my dad as a boxing trainer at about 14. Mm -hmm. And the only time I seen him from 14 to 18, apart from I think the time my mum went on holiday and I had to stay there a couple of nights, reluctantly. One of the nights I went and stayed at my mum's on my own and got caught, you know what I mean, I had the keys. <laughs> Like, I would only see him when he'd pick me up from school. He would take me to the gym, probably like, it would be Repton usually these times, or TKO gym up East London, or West Ham at the end. Um, he'd take me there, we'd do the training, and he'd drop me home. Like, that was the only relationship from 14, 18 I really had with him, M mainly, if I'm honest. Do you think you'd still be doing boxing if it wasn't for your dad, though? Um, I don't think I would have started. I, I might have started, but... I started because of my brother, really. My brother started because of stories he had from my sister and wanted to ask my dad. He took him. So I had the choice to quit and walk and never never go back at 14. That's that, That's what had, had happened for seven months. But that seven months made me realise that I don't want to just be out here just doing what everyone else is doing. Like, I had that freedom for like seven months. I used it. It was going to parties. It was, you know... Just, Being a teenager. Yeah. But like And like seeing what that's about and by the end of the summer 
my friends were calling me to go out doing what we've been doing all summer and I was making out that my mum won't let me out just so I could stay in for a bit of peace and quiet. Like, like I probably thrive better being a bit more of a homebody, popping out, doing what I need to do and then coming back. I don't feel the need to be outside like 24 seven. Do you know yeah. what I mean? I think that's important because it's sacrifice. It's sacrificing mm. what everybody else can't do. Everybody likes to go out and drink, fuck buds, smoke mm. weed, take drugs. That, that was the life I grew up in, and that, but that was the life that destroyed me. And then when you start opening your eyes, you realise I need to distance myself from the people who are still doing that. And mm. There's still people doing it in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Do you know what I mean? Like it's, there's no way out, but for you to realise that at a young age and then make excuses for you to stay and it shows you that you'd obviously seen the world a bit differently from everybody else. Yeah, I think something as well that as getting older and I'm a bit unrelated to that but with me personally like I struggle to like I struggle to get by if I don't have like some sort of physical fight competition something like there's no one I'm injured and I can't spar like that's the only time I'll really lose my head you know like I've been sparring and fighting for so many years since I was nine years old I've sparred probably I wouldn't even try and work that out but like from a kid, I was doing 10, 12 rounds up rep, doing up Newham, like from a kid. And, I, and I'll do it two, three times a week and I've carried that on all the way till now. So when I can't actually like, so when I had that period of time and I weren't fighting no one, like I weren't competing really with no one, like I felt empty. Like I felt like there's a part of my day, a part of my week, every week that just weren't there. And it was mental, like, and I'd only been boxing about five or six years at this time. But now I know what it is because like, I reckon I'll be retired and still be like moving around sparring and. Like I need it, you know, to make me feel like to make me feel something. Like I don't know, maybe some people put their foot down fast on their car or go skydiving. Yeah. Like boxing makes me feel some sort of freedom, invincibility, and vulnerableness, and freedom, and um, complete concentration, but complete nothingness in my mind at the same time. It's 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 mad the the, the, the like the level of mindset it, it brings me to, and like because I'm so used to that fix of feeling, I can't go without it. Like. I can't. Does that worry you then? Obviously your career's still just kind of starting off, 26, you've got your whole fucking life and career ahead of you. Do you still worry about that when you eventually do hang up the gloves, where you'll be? Um, A little bit. Because if you ask me now, I'll be fighting until I'm like 40. Like, definitely. My body might not let me, my career might not let me, the, the viable career options might not let me. The rest is unwritten, but genuinely, like, I can't see a moment right now where I'd think about retiring. Like, and yeah, it does scare me a little bit because if you're in a position where you finish your career and it's, you know, every time you hear or think of boxing, it's bitter. Like, if that's the the last thought process that goes into it and and as well, maybe something happens where I can't do it no more, maybe touch what it doesn't or, or yeah, maybe I just, I just, you know, retire. Like, I don't know, I feel like there's such a big part of my every single day life that will be missing. Um, just training alone. And I think the actual fighting, feeling a punch, punching someone, that whole raw emotion, like it's such an honest conversation having a fight. A boxing fight, I think is the most honest conversation two men can have. I think that discipline of standing up there on your two feet, looking at each other like, yeah, I'm ready to throw it and take a shot. Being able to do that for 36 minutes, without tiring, without the shots they're throwing, being too much, without getting knocked out, whatever. Like, it is such a hard discipline and it's such a, like an art that I, I don't know what I'd do without it. Like genuinely, I, I'm a hoping, I'm hoping, cause I'm already kind of there anyway. I hope that the coaching and the managing, which I do anyway, now alongside of my career, just because I'm so invested in boxing, it's not, oh yeah, keep your eye on your career. Like this is my career, like boxing, the whole package, package. is my career. Yeah, mm -hmm. like from commentary, the punditry, the in interviews, fighting, um, everything, little PR stuff, everything in between. It's all one package door. Yeah, like, I think it's good right to put on. these things in place now because a lot of boxers think it will never end. Yeah, of course. It's a very short-lived career, same as footballers, but you'll tend to see a lot of boxers come back, 40s, 50s, they just miss that something. Yeah, but like like right now, like right now I'm working with three fighters, Thomas Asomba, a former opponent of mine, I recently um, signed Levi Kinsiona and uh, Nikolai Prettyboy Campbell. Um, and they're all like, kind of friends. Like, obviously, one came from opponent and then sparring partner, friend. And Because right now, like, I'm not going out there. It's like it's not a financial thing. I'm not going out to try and sign fighters. 
I'm having conversations, people are coming to me, would you look after me? Do they trust me? They trust my opinion on things. They trust my my relationships with people in the business. They trust my, you know, assessing of fights, what's worth, like, like already, and I'm 26 years old, and I'm helping them out. I'm not naive enough to say, yeah, I think I can manage on my own and do all of this. So no, I'm getting them a, a licensed manager and I'm helping them, I'm helping run alongside them, speaking, sort of deliberating, making sure they're fine. And and it's it's a good way to get the experience sort of running alongside w what I'm doing because like boxing is a world full of sharks. It really is. I think people, they believe like it is what they see in the movies. They They see the shine and the smiles of the promoters and of the fight night. And then they think that's all it is. And really boxing is a rotten spot. It's rotten to the core in a lot of ways. Um, everyone's got a finger in a pie. Um, the boxers are no more than cheap prostitutes for most part, sometimes expensive ones that instead of getting laid on their back and ragged out, they get, you know, chucked in a ring and go on. Yeah, I had go, and, go and see if you yeah. can survive. Go yeah. and see if you don't get knocked out. Do you know what I mean? It's... I had Joe Kozagi on last year and he was 21 fights. Uh, I think he was world, world champion and, it, and he owed the promoter's money. Yeah, yeah, I know his story. He was getting like monthly money. He signed a mad contract. Yeah, didn't read the 20 fight print. contract or something and he ended up still owing money. Unbelievable. Yeah, well, thank God to people like Joe and stories <clears throat> like it that, you know, people like me are sat here all these years later and not in the same position. I think the education of a fighter now... Don't get me wrong, people still sign and do dumb things with their career, I see it all the time, but, you know, I think it's getting a little bit harder now. People are a little bit more on it, fighters, but, you know, it's it's horrible. If you sign a piece of paper, you could sign to anything. With boxing, it's so easy access. It's so, pretty much anyone that's got a, a checkbook slightly big enough can promote a boxing show. Unfortunately, it's just the way it is. It doesn't even have to be a big one. Um, people come in, no, no past experience. And just start, you know, playing with people's lives as such. They can put together cards. They can, you know, fly them in on the hotels, make sure their food's not right. and Whatever they're doing, like, anyone can have access. Anyone can sort of be around the boxing gym, get in a fighter's ear, and all of a sudden they're their, their new manager or their new advisor or their new nutritionist or new strength and conditioning coach. It's boxing, like no other sport, has no firewall. It has no... Here, we are protected by this union. Like, even the governing bodies that, you know, like the IBFs and the the, the, the boards, like the British, I don't, want, I don't want to be talking about anyone specifically, you know, I might get in trouble, but the boards like them sort of um, people, like, like you'd have the Latvian one or the Irish one or the, the American one where they've got all different states. But, like, the way it works is they're all taking a slight percent off you and the promoter it, it's like it's all like a trickle down so when that's the case it's never going to be a legitimate sport it's going to be where's the biggest money for everyone and, and the biggest shiniest pot of gold everyone's going to look at and then everyone that's sort of just in the in the shadows of the you know the big moment it, or the big fight or the big promoter or the big manager whoever it is that's got a level of conversations everyone else sort of just gets left behind yeah. It's like it's sad. So when you were a kid as well, when your brother was winning tournaments, did you feel an added pressure on yourself? Um, I always had kind of a lot of pressure because I was always seen as like the good one. Like I was the talented one. My brother worked hard. Do you know what I mean? I was always seen as a talented one. I started younger, had more success immediately. Like I went like seven or eight fights unbeaten. Like my brother like was like 50-50 or less than 50-50 for his first like 13, 14 or whatever. So, um, I always had the pressure, always had extremely high expectations of me. I mean, my brother at 14 years old won uh, a schoolboy European gold medal. And then, you know, the next year I lost in the final, do you know what I mean, of the England. So, like, yeah, I always had that sort of bit in my teeth where I wanted to be better, I wanted to do better, and I can see it. You know, like if my brother was always getting to that, I don't know, the London finals and losing, and then I lost in the, the national final, it would have been... I mean, it would have been great. It would have been, oh, look how far we got. But we wasn't in that sort of household. Like, winning was only the other option. It weren't really up for discussion. Um, yeah, it was... It weren't pressure in the sense of, like, him doing it. So I need to do it. But I looked at my brother like was equals, even though I was three years younger than him. So if he's doing something three years older than me, I'm thinking I should definitely be doing it three years younger. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's, it shouldn't even be up for 
debate, discussion. Seeing you're in the house, at household where it's pressure to be number one, pressure to be the best, does it take the enjoyment out of it? I don't know. My dad had different approaches to us both. Um, with me, he kind of told me and told everyone else that I was smart way beyond my years. By 14, there wasn't a boxing trainer in the UK that could tell me anything. Um, and he would say that my brother's the opposite to that, that he needs to be told he needs a good trainer, otherwise he'll go. Like, so he gave us like two different level, like mindsets and it probably has ended up you know, directly in fa like affecting how both of us are like, and how both of us react and look at life differently. Um, everything was just competitive because like, you know, in boxing it's competitive anyway. You're running, you want to run first. You're sparring, you want to think, you're, you're working, you want to work harder. It's like, it's a competitive world anyway and it's always one-on-one. -on -one. And then you put a one-on-one -on -one sport, two brothers together. Okay, I'm always smaller, but now I've caught up with boxing at the same weight. So even now, like, just the fact that me and him have got brothers in the same industry, in the same space, in the same level of success, like, that's competition on its own. Like, there's a concurrent competition where I can't fight or he can't fight, um, where someone aren't mentioning, oh, he's better than Charlie or he's better than Sonny or, or who would win in a fight. Like, it's... And obviously, yeah, obviously, we're brothers. But at the same time, we're brothers. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're brothers. But we're brothers. So well, obviously we're going to, you know, every everyone that's got a brother can experience a time when it does kick off or when people really do want to win something or do want to beat someone at something. The brothers is the worst. Like the brothers, it gets, it goes to like usually the worst extreme. Do you know what I mean? If two brothers are fighting. Yeah. Just because like it's, it's, it's that raw, we're still seven eight, nine, and 10, like aggression is, it, it, it dials back to that. Mm -hmm. You get sort of like muscle memory from your nostalgic experiences, you know what I mean? That, that's how I feel anyway. Yeah. Like, and, and obviously you deal with it different because you're not little kids now rolling around and holding each other down and giving each other dead legs and that. But like, you know I mean, when you lose it, like you lose it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. How's, what age did you turn pro? 20, I think, 20, 20. Still quite young? Yeah. What was your decision there? Um, so I never really liked England boxing or GB boxing because I'd won five, five and then six national titles in a row, beat everyone in the country for like three, four years in a row. And I never got sent to one of the, you know, like one of the majors. Yeah. I never got sent to the Europeans, never got sent to the worlds. And they always just pick some bullshit excuse. My style wouldn't work. And then I'd beat the kid that they sent. And then the next year, I'd beat the kid that they sent. Happened, f it happened five times in a row. Then I won the ABAs. I beat Galawi Afai in the semis. And I beat Joe Mafos, who was already on GB in the final. In my first year, got on GB, fine, right? Within the space of me getting sent to my first tournament for GB, Galau Yafa, who I'd beat. Bear in mind, he's a friend, so it's not like negative. This is just my perspective, isn't it? and he knows this anyway. Um, before I got sent to my first, and it's not because I was overweight and it weren't because I was injured, he'd been sent to five different events, a couple of WSB and a couple of tournaments, five different, and he performed quite well. But I beat him, and we got on GB at the same weekend. And now by far the time I got sent to my first, which wasn't even a good tournament, but I had some good countries there, He's already been sent five, done WSB twice. It's like there's clear favoritism. And inspiring, if I'll be real, like I don't feel like anyone ever gets the better of me, ever, really, like genuinely, like I don't. And so up there, I was very confident how the spars were going. I beat him, I couldn't understand it. But I had my first tournament I got sent to after like four or five months. Um, GBs in Finland. In my first fight, I was the first fight at the whole tournament. My first fight as a senior international amateur, whatever, whatever elite open class for GB. I drew the Kazakhstan world number, I think two or three. Three years previously, he was the world champion, the Aiba world champion. He'd qualified, he'd been to two Olympics and got to quarterfinals twice, losing to the gold medalist both times. And he'd already qualified for Rio. That was who my first fight was. First fight of the tournament was literally about one, boom, it was us two. And I beat him, Fracked, um, snapped the ligament in my thumb, Got pulled out the next day, got sent to Harley Street straight from the airport. Complete rupture in my phone. Complete in the back of the thing. So I'm out now. 
within three, four weeks, Galau, that, that win put me number one, definitely. There, there hadn't been a better win at my weight. I was out. Three weeks later, Galau gets sent to the qualifiers, qualifiers. Um, three weeks after that, I decided against the wish of GB to enter the ABAs. They told me not to. I thought, what am I doing sat around here for? I had one hand, jumped in ABAs. Lost in the final, I thought I should have won. It was a close fight, nothing fight, if honest. But the moment that decision went, I went, yeah, fuck this. I went, I'd made it in my mind before I got to the change room, I made it. I said to Grant, the first thing I said to him, I turned to pro. I said, fuck this, it's bullshit. Like, um, I weren't waiting around for another four years. A funny story, actually, a month later, so I'd already turned pro. I was already turning pro, I think I'd already signed a contract. Rob McCracken, I was everyone knows Rob McCracken, AJ's old trainer. Thanks, Rob. He rings me up. I hadn't been on GB. I hadn't. I just hadn't turned up. Yeah, <laughs> no one asked me. I just hadn't turned up. Just stayed down. I thought, fuck that. I'm not going. I was on my. I was on full time, and I was on my probation. They give you three months to see if it will suit your life. <laughs> it didn't suit my life, James. <laughs> you know what I mean, um, Rob rang me three weeks after. He went, son. He went, you doing anything next week? And I know. You're not, I know you've not been in the gym, but he went. It's WSB in uh, Great Britain, Lion Hearts versus Kazakhstan semi finals. Can't get anyone at 49 or 52 kilo to do the 52 kilo wild card. Everyone said no. And I was like, when is it? He was like, oh, you got to meet the team down like, tomorrow or the next day. I was like, yeah, sound. Just went and met up the team. Tried to to fight. I was the wild card. So it had to be five all. Yeah. And it looked like it was going. Earlier on in the day, I had an allergic reaction to nuts. Yeah. So I was nearly being sick in the thing to an allergic reaction to nuts. Yeah. And I'm still warming up to go and fight this kid, Kazakhstan, international weight above um, on Box Nation, I think it was at the time, and I didn't get the chance to to fight. But I said on taking that to Rob, I went, Rob, you see, if I take this, yeah, if we go to the final, you've got to take because the final was in, I don't know where it was, but it was against Cuba. And I went, if if I take this fight, I said onto the phone, you've got to take me to Cuba, or fight Cuba, wherever it was. And he went, yeah, and he went back on his word and took Galau and Muhammad Ali, didn't he? But they both were qualified for the Olympics, so I did understand, but. Yeah, that was like me deciding, fuck this. I'm 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 sort of done with the amateur setup. Bear in mind, I'd been watching my brother, you know, tin can journeyman and get paid for it for the last year and a half. It's hard. Yeah. And everyone on GB, like even the lads, I was hearing stories and I'd seen messages. Like I was getting laughed at by the coaches. I was getting laughed at by the other fighters, by the staff, because they didn't think I had the style. They didn't think I had the the mentality. I was always told my style wouldn't work until it did. Yeah. And it's just never not worked, James, I'll be real. It's mad that the fucking amateur game, same as Josh Taylor, I think, he had to pay back the Olympics or the Commonwealth four grand or eight grand after winning gold. What, because he left? Yeah. Yeah, but that's because he left out of contract. I think he left. Or apparently he still had to pay them back money. Yeah, so basically it's like when you get on GB, <clears throat> you you jump like in this period of time, when you get on GB, you get like a three month uh, like probation. And then at the end of that, you can just decide I don't want to extend. But if not, they'll get you racked into like a two, a one, two or three or four year like contract, basically. And it's literally like a contract. Like people think, oh, amateurs, oh, it's lottery funded. It's all, nah, there's more money and more fingers in pies in that amateur shit than fucking anything else. Look how much money the Olympic generates, like how corrupt it is. Yeah. It is ridiculous. Like all I'm saying is, yeah, there's not one boxing gym from professional boxing that I know that could remotely compare with what the GB set up of. They've got about 30 staff. They've got fucking nutritionists. They've got physios. They've, they're, they're, like, they're like, going to GB is like joining a football team or joining a uh, American football team or something like that to that level, top of the range. Where's all that money coming from? Why is trainers on like 80 grand, 100k a year and fighters are on 700 pound a month? Like, it's just mad. Shit, is it? Yeah, like it's, it's proper. Like when I when I deeped how like backwards it is, like that, that amateur game, they're giving you like a little chump change. And like the coaches that aren't even like full-time coaches on like 30, 40 grand a year, way more than the fighters. And they're fucking, some of them are useless. Like not even trying to, like some of them are very good coaches, some of them are good coaches, but some get on there and they're not good coaches, you know what I mean? Everyone, like, and you'll know which ones aren't because no one want to work with them. <laughs> They'll walk in the thing and everyone will be like, I'm not, not trying to get eye contact for pads. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's a ma it is a mad thing, but obviously that's kind of the the world we live in, isn't it? They'll, they'll tell you that it's all for like, 
good and positive things yeah. and really they're just getting people to fight for nothing and then attract billions of eyes when it comes around at the Olympics and yeah. Commonwealth and that's crazy you fought some great names in amateurs but what was the step up like for your first pro fight did you see a difference if you know what the first one was a hard one like um, not a hard fight really but like I'm mixing it with the best I've just done all of this and then I'm fighting the 41 year old man small I'd lost 70 times one like 15 20 but genuinely quite tough like knew his way around the boxing ring like so it was just it was like a hard range of emotions you know what I mean like because he was better than he looked but he weren't very good but like he was better tougher but he just looked like an old man you know what I mean and I looked like a young boy he was literally double my age on my debut but it was just like obviously it's my first fight and I was very young so that was probably like trying to match me like okay let's see what he's got but I'll be real like I'd I've always been a long round fighter. I used to spar 10, 12 rounds as a 12 year old kid in Newham gym, as a, as a 14, 15 year old kid in Repton, like as a kid, like all newcomers, five, six different opponents doing two rounds at a time. So the rounds for me, if anything, the problem was free. Like anytime I lost in the amateurs, any single time, I'd probably lose the first round, be back in it by the second and be on top by the third. And it was just how the score would go. Cause I was kind of a slow starter. Um, like, I'm a legit 36 minute or even longer. I'm a I'm a long round fighter. Like I don't like fighting doesn't phase me. I could do one 45 minute round. It does not phase me. Like all of that is is I'm reading the the person that's opposite me. I'm reading their engine and and trying to drain it and make them make make, make the mistakes. And I look at boxing from a complete different lens to I think 90 percent, probably even more than that. And that's why I think I've not found the change easy. Uh, not found the change hard. I've always trained hard. I know what training I need to do. I've always been fit for it. Um, I've got the focus for it. I've got the sort of, like, the like the focus on it. Like, I don't, when I'm in there for 36 minutes, there's not one part of me that ever wants to get out of the ring. Like, a big shot lands. You'll see me smile. You'll, see, you'll, you'll hear me tell them it's a good shot. Like, I turn a positive into a negative. I don't mind getting hit. Like, I try to avoid it because I don't like losing. But like, if anything, when you get caught with that one shot for me, it usually switches me on. Like that, like whatever that shock is that goes through my central nervous system, like it's it's, it's not a bad thing for me. Like I don't, I've been I've been getting punched in the face for seventeen years. Like it's really kind of like second nature. If anything, now I feel like when I spar, I just have wars all the time. Even if, if they're not like proper wars, like I want to make it like a bust up. Because when I fight, I don't really get them. <laughs> now, seriously, like, I could show you something. I could, I've seen your face, bro. Yeah. You move like if even my last fight, I let him have a more of a bust up. Anytime I wanted to move, I could have moved. Mm -hmm. Um, but like, I just I, I, I like doing what I want to do. Like, Grant was shouting at me, yeah, I know, I know, Grant, you know what I mean? I've got the rounds counted in my head. Like, I, I just I, I, I enjoy the physicality of it, I enjoy the sport. Like, I wish I liked the business more, I wish I liked like the entertainment side of it more, I wish I liked. Even like the media and stuff. Cause obviously I know right now it sounds a bit like, oh, do you know what I mean? But like genuinely, I don't do much really to try and just be out there or be seen or be noticed or like, I don't want to be known as really anything other than a boxer. I like that I can kind of pretty much right now still live my life relatively low key. Obviously you might get a wee bump people that know you and whatnot, but anyone does, don't know who you are. So... Yeah, I like I like that it's like that. I don't want to, you know, I didn't win my world title and start thinking about how am I going to be the next or how am I going to get my name to this? Nah, I was back in the gym, sparring a week later, a week and a half later. Training, fight date, training, fight date, training. Like, I've got a legacy and a level of greatness that I want to achieve in this sport that I will only achieve it by dedicating every time I can in the gym. Mm -hmm. like, even, okay, I might, I might be out on a party. I might be out um, on foods and doing whatever in between my camps. But I guarantee no matter where I was or where I've been the night before or I'll be in the gym. <laughs> honestly, James, like honestly, some stories I can't even tell on this camera, but certain things have happened. I've been in the gym within 24 hours. Crazy. Like I don't miss it. I, I feel like that's the biggest stress, you know, like missing stuff like that. And yeah. that causes me the stress. Like I feel, I, feel, like, I feel guilty on myself if I don't go to the gym and train for an hour. I'm a full-time athlete and I can't go to the gym and just do like six rounds on bags or something just to keep it ticking. Like, it's embarrassing of me when there's people that I've got around me that are 
waking up 6.45, going for a run, then going work until fucking 7 o'clock at night, then coming home and training. Like, it's embarrassing of me to not go gym. Even if I'm out of camp, like, I still feel bad. Do you know what I mean? You're always fight ready. Fight ready in the sense of to get in the ring and have a fight a billion percent. Yeah, but weight-wise, like you sell nah, a lot of boxers nah, 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 put nah. on a stone or two. Nah, nah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I think any boxer that does, unless you get to the stage of, say I went through the weights and now I'm lightweight or super lightweight and that's what I'm fighting at. Yeah, I'd probably be like a mayor of always staying on more. But now nah, I feel like, I feel like it's good to let yourself grow, especially when you're younger. I feel like once you know you can be in control of the range of your weights and that, I think it's good to manipulate it. I think I'm developing and filling out more now because I'm having more time in between fights consistently over years to sit at, you know, a box of 50.8 kilos, that's very light. Within three days, I'm probably like 58. 59 within two weeks and probably like 62 63 and then i just sort of plateau there and stay there but it's, it's a lot of weight to some people but to me it's not yeah like to me it's not I, I look at the scale like i get on the scales 10 kilos overweight and so some people that is ridiculous to hear to me that's i'm in a good place that's where i want to be yeah, I put on two pound, mate, and I think I'm a fat mm. cunt, mate. Yeah, I don't mind me, I don't <laughs> mind. I, I like the dad bod me. So you're 18 and all now. So when did you start believing? Was it from turning pro straight away that you really, you knew that you were going to be a world champion or did it take time to develop? I've had a lot of belief in myself for a long time. Like when I'm 15, 16, I was sparring pros and stuff. I was, I mean, my first, I remember Ian Napper, I don't know if you remember him, but he was like the British man over. Maybe not with the record and all the money, but he was a very good defensive fighter. I used to spar him as like a kid and like he was a good level at, at certain points in his career. But I've always had a lot of confidence because I don't have much experience in boxing rings. I'm not the man, James, if I'm honest. Like, there's, I, could, I couldn't even really think of a time I've been in the ring with someone that's made me feel like I don't belong. Like... And I could literally probably sit here and start naming a list of a hundred times people have got out of the ring of me, flustered, red faced, frustrated, head falling off, talking about oh, fucking I can't even hit him. Mm -hmm. Like, and it's not me being big headed. And anyone that spars me knows I'm not being disrespectful. I never call people directly, but <laughs> they know it's true. Like, I'm good. I'm really good. I'm much better, much much better than anyone's remotely seen in a in a professional fight. I box safe when I fight. I box to win. I don't box to to have fun. Like. And I never box to excite, unfortunately. I think people that do that will end up losing. Um, I box to win when I fight, but I don't box to win when I spar. I box to show levels, if that makes sense. Yeah. Where does your movement come from? Because I used to love Prince Nazim, man, but I see a bit of you in that kind of movement as well. That There's not many boxers do that. Um, the, the moving and the, the, the perfection of just slight inches of how they float around the ring. Like You've got that in abundance, man. It, it probably come from... The first two years of taking clean shots to the face, I'd start crying as a, as a, as a boxer from nine to about 11. I'd start crying. Not in a sense of, <laughs> it would more be like, you know, them angry, hyperventilating, like crying, but like not crying. It'll be like one tear, come down there. And you're like getting angry and that. Like that, that's what I was for about two years. Just getting hit in the face. Like it got me angry, like I was, and I think, yeah, going back to what I was talking about earlier with my with my uh, uh with what used to go on with my parents and, and, and then breaking up and that I think that might have played a release. deal with it. But yeah, because even like on football before boxing, like if something happened to me that I didn't like, I would get so angry. Like like I'd I'd explode. Like what's that um what's that that Disney film? I watched it with my kid when it's like, is it like inside out when you can see the, the emotions? Anyway, mm -hmm. this little red, the anger, it just, and the head would just blow off. That used to be me as a kid, real bad. And I think boxing helped me put a lid on that. I think without boxing, I probably never would have put a lid on that. Um, and now to the point of, I'm probably one of the calmest individuals 99% of the time. Don't get me wrong, I can get giddy and then get excited and I can have a mess about. But the most part, I'm laid back. I'm mentally quite stable. I'm consistent with my actions, with my energy. So but I think boxing helped. Cause like I said, I was a fucking head case. I was just like, I wouldn't be breathing. I'd just... <laughs> like, making mad noises and that, like just a fucking little loon. Like, I just yeah. get so angry, go bright red. I got veins. I have veins on the side of my head, right? Prominent veins. My kids have them too. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I've ever seen anyone else with them. Yeah, um, but when I get angry, 
they start like, especially when I was young, they used to like pulse out the side of my head. It was mad. Yeah, the cortisol going through your body. Oh, like, but but like I had it in there. Like I had a burning desire of, and that's why I'm so glad I found boxing because I don't think I ever would have got it out in football. Mm-hmm. I don't think I ever would have got it out. Maybe in rugby, I enjoyed rugby for years. Um, but yeah, apart from that, I probably wouldn't have ever got it out. Um, yeah. yeah, 15 feet, your world title, your massive underdog. I think yeah, I probably should have been more than what I was. I think I was... Was he not 13 years on? Un- 13 years unbeaten. Yeah, okay, he, he got to a point where he was old, but he showed no slowing down. He'd just been punching everyone up still. Yeah. Like he, He's still been beating people convincingly by knockout and going to their country and busting them up. Um, and being in the ring with him, it was probably the hardest fight I've ever had. Um, probably the best person I've ever been in the ring with. He... He didn't look to have as much success as he made me work, if that makes sense. Because he weren't really landing all too much and I was doing everything I needed to do at the right time. He didn't get to build any of his success, but he genuinely posed a threat, a level of intimidation, a level of physical pressure that I have not really seen before in a ring, if I'm honest. Like, and it weren't because, oh, look, I'm, oh, I'm for a world title. Because genuinely, as the final bell ra- went last 10, that's when I remembered it was for a world title. Like, all of them things, winning, losing, drawing, world titles, belts, accolades, boxer of the years, like, it's all nice. But the main thing I'm, like, I like fighting. So whether it's for a no title, whether it's for 17 world titles all at once, like, I do not, like, it's not going to change how I want to win in there. That's just gonna uh, affect the ceremony or how people, how nice people are to me after maybe. Like, it doesn't actually change what I do because I go and I'm buzzing and I wake up in the morning and I have my, my my breakfast to go and spar as if it was a fight. Like, I love it that much. Yeah. Like, so all the other stuff's immaterial. Like, someone's always gonna have an opinion. I'm gonna walk out here. You're gonna have an opinion on me. People that watch is gonna have an opinion on me. Might be positive, might be negative. They might like me, they might not. They might think I dress good, they might think I dress bad. But what is it going to change? Even if everyone's the same or everyone's different, like it's not going to change anything in me. I don't really care. Like I'm just trying to exist and thrive in a world that is littered by sharks and dead ends and f- trap doors and, and yeah. snakes and ladders and... And everything in between, but it's fun. It's like the game of life. And hopefully I have, I've done so well. I, like, even if it all just goes straight from this point onwards, I managed to climb up through the rankings when the British the international titles, slap a world title before I got defeated and defend it twice. There is not that many 26-year-old boxers anywhere in this world that can say that and be number one in the world. And after this next fight, we'll be unified and ring, hopefully, and definitely number one and then maybe the next fight after that push top 10 pound for pound like, I've got that all in my sights and there's the interest in the, the weights that I'm around right now flyweight and super flyweight there's the investment more importantly from you know, you had Tom Lofler before all the super fly cards you've got Eddie Hearn now pumping loads of money into all the flyweight super flyweight fights because general public a bit more but the boxing people have realised that these fights are probably up there with the best fights we get mm-hmm. now, you know once you actually are entertained by both fighters a flyweight fight is probably as good as a super flyweight fight is probably better than most weights. Okay, until you see the knockout. But the actual fight, the actual watching it, the actual reactions, the actual speed, the skill, like we have smaller bodies, more compact, more easy and efficient to do things. So sometimes, yeah, you see fights where ridiculous amount of punches were thrown that you'd never see a welterweight or a heavyweight, something like that. Mm-hmm. And I think like people are getting onto the idea that you know, someone might be five foot three or other and they can still fucking have it out. Like, yeah. like it's as simple as that. And then the fights are good to watch and they're exciting. And yeah, oh, oh, because he's six foot seven. And I think, I think it is changing a bit. But don't get me wrong. I, as a boxing fan outside of a flyweight boxer, there's no night like a big heavyweight fight. Like, and there, there probably never, ever will be. Like, that is just the allure of the two, like, Hercules-esque alpha... T- Freaks and natures of men fighting each other. Like, obviously, it's a different sort of intrigue. But I do genuinely think that the the flyweight division has been buzzing like it never has been, to be honest. And I think the money that's getting thrown around for the fights is like it's never even been remotely close to really outside of maybe the odd superstar in one corner. But 
you can't really account for that. They're anomalies, do you know what I mean? Yeah. What's the best title you've won? IBF or Dad. Yeah. Dad, yeah, yeah, I won that twice. <laughs> and the boxing ring, because you've won a few titles, but it was not not even the British the first time you'd won a belt. Nah, do you know why? Because that British, like, it wasn't like a proper British fight for me, because that kid shouldn't have been in the ring with me, really. Like, all the other fighters better than him didn't want to fight, so then he got it. And I've had it for 18 months before I won the world title. Not one person, do you know, like every month, you know, every month the, the, the British board, they meet, they sit around the table, whatever they do, Oh, um, oh, we've had letters from this fighter, this fighter, this fighter. They want to fight for the British title at this weight again. <laughs> and they do all of that. You know, for 18 months in a row, yeah, not one person, not one fighter, not one manager, not one promoter, nothing, yeah, put forward to the board a wish to fight for the British title at my weight for 18 months. Why? <laughs> want to fight me? And everyone was offered everyone was offered pussies oh yeah no 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 but you know you always hear with me it was always oh that fight's bigger in the future oh we'll fight that for a bigger title but who's got the bigger title and then you see you, see, you hear a few creep out you know you hear a few creep out now yeah you're getting paid well and now if you lose you've lost a world champion and now but when I needed you at the crossroads uh, you weren't nowhere to be seen and what happened, you know what the funniest thing is? Do you know why the reason why I got here so seamlessly and had all the fight dates that I did? Because I was very easy to work with. I negotiated my contract 18 months, three years at a time and stuck to it, weren't trying to negotiate more each fight and being a prima donna. Oh, if I could fight him for that. No, I just wanted to get there and get there quick, James. I fought seven times back, 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 back in 14 months period and I had two months off <clears throat> injured. All on TV, all title fights against any, the first opponent they said every single time. Because I was hell bent that I'm not going out like the rest of these losers. If I'm honest, like they just say no to fights and then when they eventually get beat, no one cares about them. I've said yes to everyone, so at least maybe if I did get beat, well, at least he said yes to every opponent. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We now we fucked up because you know what I mean? Like that was my that was my mindset. And because of that mindset, I became one of the best fighters to work with. Um BT loved me. Um they had me on, like I said, seven T V slots in the space of fourteen months. Definitely the most active out of any fighter in on to any network, and it was all title fights, like I said. Um, but what happened was, every single time, every single level, I was calling out everyone. Like I was calling out people I was on GB with for English and Southern Area titles because I know I'm gonna get to world level. I don't know that you're gonna get to world level, so I might as well fight you here. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And then look at all them people that I didn't know if they would get to world level, and I know they'd get to Southern Area, or English, or British. Where are they all now? They're, yeah. not, they're not around no more, James. Yeah. Do you ever get they're emotional? not around no more. And who's that because of? Do you know what I mean? Do you ever get emotional? About? Winning? Nah. Never? Nah. After world titles, I nah. never released that. I fucking told you so. At least, go back and watch Maruti, yeah? The Maruti decision. So I've just kind of schooled him a bit for 12 rounds. My trainer, the fans were shouting. I go over to his corner. And you see, like, the slight break in my coolness. I sort of, as they're reading out, I've realised what I've just done and I like, kind of like hit my head a couple of times, like just like tap, 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 and then back to call. And then when I won, finger up, I'm the winner, go say the thing. Because one thing I was taught, and maybe it just stuck me, maybe it should, maybe, maybe like I should take this out of my game because maybe it'd be better if I did. My dad always made a point of, you know the people that couldn't believe that they just won? You know what I mean? And the winner is, do you know what I mean? Uh -huh. What's that? Why Why would you want to go out like that? Why would you want everyone in here to think that you cannot believe you just won? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that ear of confidence and that ear of mystique and that I've just won a world title, I broke a smile, went over, and then the first thing I've said is I don't think them scorecards were right. They didn't give my opponent a chance. Like that's just, that, that, that is my mindset. Because right? I, I believed I was world champion from the moment I signed the fight. Gen genuinely hand on heart like I'm world champion now 30th of May uh, 30th of April see you then and it happened like I want nervous like I want like all the fighting that like, is second nature to me and because I love it so much the higher the stakes the more I love it because with me it's always been stacked of chips against me and I will come over mm -hmm. every single time every single hard hard fight is when I've pulled out the best the times I've lost had setbacks is always against someone I'm supposed to beat 
Yeah, for that fight, I schooled everybody for 13 years, but for you to then school him, like, how did that make you feel, being an underdog? Did that Does that spur you on to prove to people, I'm going to show you what I'm capable of, or is it a case of just do the business and move on to the next? So I wish I had more interesting answers. I just like beating people. Mm-hmm. I just like beating people. Like I just like fighting. It, like For me, it genuinely doesn't matter who it is. I think I'll find a way to beat him. Weight's above me as well, and I think I'll I'll go to show it. Um, every every dog has their day. You can have off nights and all that. But the way I approach it, like I don't, I I don't like boxing. Isn't a cash grab for me. Boxing isn't. Um, boxing isn't. I want to be famous. Boxing isn't. I want to prove to everyone that I'm a man and I'm strong. And nah, I want to prove to one person, and that's my opponent. That's it. Everything else, James. I can't stress it enough. Doesn't matter. I want my I want my corner to be happy with me. I want them to be. I want them when I go to the thing. I want them to say, "Yeah, do you know what?" And not all the time. Cause sometimes I don't always listen because <laughs> sometimes I'm stubborn. Ah. But like, like I just want to win. I just want to be better. Like maybe yeah, part maybe showing better. But that's just like it, it. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. World titles. It doesn't matter that this fight maybe is for ten times more than money than any. Do you know what I mean? All of that genuinely doesn't, and I'm glad it doesn't. I'm glad that that's all an afterthought for me. I'm glad that, like, and maybe because of that, the negative comments don't, or even if I do bite off more than I can chew, and now it's I'm picking up the pieces, why I don't care? Because I just want to test myself, and I want to push my levels to the, to the max of their potential, and I feel like if I keep using my position of maybe comfortability like I could choose to just you know never go to any other country just I'm, I'm arguably the biggest name in the division um I could just sort of do the whole yeah this is my fault you have to fight me here all I'm protected and just try and pick my way and work my way through a boxing career but I don't want to do that how was your fight in Dubai with Wasim yeah fine sound like I enjoyed it like it weren't hard it weren't remotely out of something that wasn't what I can do over and over and over again. Um, I approached it and fought, especially at times, a certain way just to show him I can do what I did. And, and the scorecards, I think, were a bit of a joke, to be honest. I thought they were 118s, 117s were more right. How they ever gave 115s, I'll never know. Didn't lose five rounds. Didn't think no one had me losing five rounds. Um, but it was just, again, to show that I can pick and choose and do what I want. Like, if I want to box and move for 12 rounds, I could probably do it for the next 15 years and no one's beating me, James. Mm-hmm. Not over 12 rounds. Let's Not. talk about this mega fight in Mexico. What's the plans for this? Is this cemented down yet? Well, we've been speaking about it for now, coming up to about three weeks. Um, I'd been chasing it for ages, since he pretty much got out of the ring with my brother, to be honest. Um... As soon as I got a world title, he's who I wanted. As soon as I defended it the first time, I mentioned him in the ring. As soon as I defended it the second time, I mentioned him again in the ring. Um, I want the fight desperately. It's the the biggest for legacy. It's the biggest. Um, it makes the most sense about everything. It's also stylistically a fight that I completely love. Um, and yeah, I, I love the contrasting styles. I love the contrasting cultures. The whole Mexico versus uh, Britain has been popping for the last however many years. It's been a good little rivalry that we are kind of getting danced all over on at the moment. So I'm looking to pull one back. Um, in negotiations, I only had one place in my mind that I really wanted to do it, and that was Mexico City, where um, Martinez is from one of the roughest areas of. Um, he came to London. He He... You know, had a, a good couple of rounds against my brother. He had him hurt when he went down. He hit him way late. Do you know Why what I mean? Why did he do that? I don't know. Maybe he thought he'd get away with it. Maybe he was just in the moment. Maybe because of the way my brother went down, maybe he didn't see him fully. Maybe he did. Maybe he's just a little dickhead. I have no clue. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I have no clue. But I will thank him. I will thank my brother because... Without that, without the controver- controversy, without the storyline, this fight wouldn't be as big as it is. Like, this fight wouldn't be as intriguing, as interesting. Like, there's a video I posted yesterday, the, the, the late shot lands and the angle, you can see one person, and that's me, and you can see the way I'm looking at him. 
like thing and then you see me break into the realization of what happened after do you know what i mean but you can see the look in my eye and i remember what was going through my head sat ringside and my big brother just getting put down and hit like late like, i can remember i was coming from that moment i was coming from that moment I even mentioned it in an interview like yo let me have martinez do you know what i mean like i was coming from that moment and i weren't just coming to fight i was coming to you i had in my plan from then i'm coming to mexico i'm coming over because you've done it and now it's time for me to do it to you because yeah. at the end of the day, James, if someone comes up to your house, knocks on the door and hits your brother in the face, what do you do? Go yeah. to their house, you know what I mean? <laughs> you don't stay at home. Yeah. You don't stay at home, James. Mm -hmm. Not the way I've been raised or not the way I've grown up or, or existed to this certain point. Like, I feel like there's certain things in life that just have to be balanced out properly. Actual balance, you know what I mean? I believe in balance and, and restoring it. And... Yeah, I'm going to go over to Mexico, hopefully. Like I said, I, I do believe it's going to be Mexico. I do. I've pushed for it. I think they're pushing for it. Um, it was just getting green lighted. So I'm hoping, hopefully, this ain't just, you know what I mean, because yeah. the other option was America. But like I said, that don't ring the same for me. That's neutral to me. Like, it, it's not because he's, he's fought there and he's over there, but that's neutral to me. I want to go where your people are. And the there. All of your people. <clears throat> I want to go in there. The kit I'm going to be wearing, James. Is it gonna be mad? I mean, if 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 I get this, go down, do it, and it is for the WBC, the IBF, the Ring Magazine, walking in Mexico City, what I'll be wearing, I think it could go down as an iconic moment in British boxing history. Because there's not many British boxers went to Mexico and won. Nah, not no, many. I because think, there's not many like fighters like me from Britain. I think Willie Lemond, Scottish guy, he went to Mexico. He's, he fought in front of 40,000, 50,000 Mexicans. How many would take their world title to defend over there? Nah, none. On an Eddie Hearn show? Yeah, that's <laughs> going to be unbelievable. But I think that shows your character to prove a point, do things that's never been done. Yeah. To get, is that where you get that buzz? Yeah, like I like doing the, the things they tell me I can't because it's mad. Like if you ask me, Sonny, go up to Bantamweight in your next fight and fight any of the world champions on a random hat. I'd say, yeah. And I think I could beat him. Even the scary ones. Even the ones that, no, you couldn't beat him. You couldn't even get in the ring of him. Because trust me, I've sparred and fought many a scary people that when they get in the ring, aren't, aren't as scary normal. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm like a... Uh, uh, what them fire extinguisher blankets. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, you ain't got a fire extinguisher, you've got a thing, just chuck on it. And it goes... Yeah. That's, that, that's kind of like my style. I'm like, I'm like the ice, I'm like the water to the fire. How long do you stay at Flyweight for? As long as I want, it's not that hard for me to make. I've, you know, I mean, I'm doing some behind the scenes, being a bit more serious for this one, from a bit further out. You know what I mean? No, like, no more cutting corners, because obviously now I'm balancing, I'm balancing a lot of people's livelihoods. I'll be real. Um, I'm grateful to be in a position where, you know, maybe the people that have invested time, energy, and effort into me are now getting rewarded in a way that they. It should be for like one fight work, do you know what I mean? But with that responsibility comes a lot of people relying on me, do you know what I mean? Like the pay structure is it, changed, you know? And then there's first purses when you're getting like, I don't know, six grand for a six rounder or something. And it's just like, here you go, here you go. Oh, it's not that anymore, do you know what I mean? It's they get paid and it's them over there, them over there, ch -ch -ch -ch. like on the way down, the boards take their little, and the, the belts take their little, you know what I mean? So it's, but that's just, that, that just is what it is. But I'm glad that, when that whole trickle down happens, I'm happy with always what I get. That's why I negotiate. I don't negotiate, you know, the 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 the, the gross. Do you know what I mean? I, I'm what I'm getting. That's what I care about. Everyone else, chop it up as you please, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But I'm just glad that I'm in a position now where I'm sort of helping provide for people that have helped me for so long, and maybe helping a couple of fights like this keep going and then change everyone's life around me. To be honest, how do you keep that? Because when you start doing well, the leeches pop out from everywhere. Do you become kind of a loner where you mm. need to be careful who to trust? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, it's easy for people to, you know, want to sniff around you for the wrong reasons. Um, Just, but you seem as if you know your energies and that who to fucking kick off and fuck yeah, off straight away. Like, anyway. You know what it is? I'm not like, I'm very civil and I'm very like social when I want to be, but like, I'm not easy access. Like, the very few people know how to pull up to my house. You know what I mean? They don't know the directions. They don't know what area it is. They wouldn't know the postcode. You know what I mean? Like, um, very few people I would have around my kids. Very few people I would go and check up on them. Like a lot of friends you have, you see them when you're outside already. Do you know what I mean? And I've got a lot of very good friends like that. Um, some of them they do, you know, they they break into like your inner circle. But like I just don't give that much opportunity 
You know what I mean? My yeah. I haven't got much of a soft belly on show. Like it's not. I get me wrong. You probably do get a few people that might like you for the wrong reasons. But um, if you trace, you know, my Instagram pictures from now to six, seven years ago, five years ago, especially, you're seeing all the same faces. Before maybe I was world champion earning X Y Z and being able to go out and do whatever and people ask me whatever whatever the reason someone might want to leech off me be mm -hmm. yeah or, or leech off me but I've got the same people around me that have for years ever since I've been in Sheffield really I've, I've been sort of running with the same sort of Crowd. same sort of click yeah yeah how did your relationship with Lyndon Arthur start you seem very close yeah yeah love big Lyndon man like, yeah he's been down podcast. here really. yeah, he's yeah, been down yeah. I watched it um, how's um how did that relationship because he's always got your back he's always at your face like yeah like we're genuinely like like up, like, like kind of best friends ish do you know what I mean mm. like obviously we don't live in each other's city so we're not every day checking up for each other do you know what I mean but we speak every week definitely most days phone call I spoke to him last night at like 2 o'clock in the morning was having a buzz do you know what I mean um, we met originally in the ABAs about 2013 2014 he was in them my brother was in them I weren't I was too young chatted then then was on GB together like just met then on GB, and you know when you're just similar energy, similar vibes. The I like GB. I'll be real, yeah. When I was on a development squad, so that's every other weekend. You mm -hmm. go Thursday to Sunday. I think it's different now, but every other weekend, I like that. I like the lads that we got on with, um, like some of the lads just to name. There was Felix Cash, Dalton Smith, Lyndon Arthur. Um, there's a few more. There, 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 there is a lot more. I don't want to be just sitting and listing, but that little squad was wicked. We had a right good laugh. It was proper like. Everyone got on, um, yeah, it was a good crack. When I went to the podium though, you know, cause I'd sort of jumped on and all these lads have been on four or five years. Most of them were my, my brother's friends and I'm sort of the mouthy little annoying brother that's just popped on like, Jack Bateson, funnily enough, probably didn't even like me when I first got on because um, something that happened previous, but now we're good, good friends actually. Um, yeah, I, it just, I actually did like GB at once upon the time, but then, it was, it was, I think it was the full time as well. Like, I liked my own coach. I liked my own like, Grant, who I'm still with now. Like, I don't know. I, working with one person who has their heart like, into you, into your career, when they're doing your corner, you're their fighter, they want you to do better, versus someone that's part of a coaching staff, 10, 12 coaches, maybe even more. They're having debriefing meetings, how they're going to do things. Do like, you know like the difference? Yeah. The emotions taken out of it, and your guy, you'll go to Poland or wherever people are going, and the corner won't even be caring if you're winning. Yeah, I can't have that energy around me because I won't thrive in that. I need passion, I need dedication. Mm -hmm. I went from my dad steering my career, making sure we was in his eyes, always in the best place with the best coach, blah, blah, blah. and then Grant, who's kind of the same. He he is also a, a, a boxing coach, but he's a, a boxing dad as well. Dalton Smith, um, obviously being his son, so. Like he understood it, he understood what I needed, and more than anything, I just needed to make sure that I had someone in my life, in my coaching, that was on it, you know, organised, um, didn't drop the ball, because then I haven't got to worry about all the... the or making sure my sparring is going to be there, or where am I training, or when am I training. You know, just having someone that yeah. it's all just done professionally as if they're running a business. Like, that's what I needed, because I had that with my dad, you know, and I went up somewhere else, um, and I didn't have that. It was a bit more all over the place. Turn up, trainer might not be there. Go to everyone, get to the track at eight o'clock in the morning. Half an hour later, finally get hold of the trainer. Oh, go on, lad, just go for a steady. Like I had that as well at the beginning of my pro career. Mm -hmm. So like, I just think I found like a good structure, a, a lane. Like I don't like, I don't do too much. Like I don't, I'm not out here killing myself or torturing myself. Like I have hard sessions. But I'm listening to my body. I know when I'm fit, I'm sparring a lot. I'm learning, I'm developing my IQ. I'm helping the other boys. I'm trying to see how other problems get solved. I'm really trying to expand like the encyclopedia of boxing in my head with everything, with the managing, with the training, with the promoting, with the, the punditry, the commentary. Like, I'm doing all of this concurrently, like I said before. Yeah. But just because I know that every sort of layer of better understanding, I'm getting better as a fighter. Yeah, you made the headlines last week, you were fighting a troll, oh, which is, uh, how did that come about? James, do you know what, yeah? It's a mad one, because like, obviously we deal with messages all the time, and most things like, you don't even take them seriously. I might reply to a few, but like I said before, it's just content, mm -hmm. and they're the content creators, and I'm just 
you know, like like I'm a tennis player. Pew, pew, like, because yeah. nothing will ever get past me because I don't actually care enough. Like, I'm just not even trying to keep my name relevant because it, it's not even really about that. But if they're going to be just chatting shit to me, I want the final say. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I want to put my little full stop on it. And now everyone's laughing because you're on my timeline anyway. You know what I mean? Like, you're a fake account and I've got 50,000 people. Half of them probably like me. Mm -hmm. So now it's like, it's even like, you know, like the popular kid at school. Like, I was never, yeah. I always had friends, but you know, there was that popular kid at school that could run any joke, say anything, and they would all be everyone up in arms and yeah. couldn't believe how funny it was. And you'd be looking there thinking, Wanker. He's not even funny. <laughs> no, but you'd like him. You think he's not even funny? <laughs> like, that was, I've just made like a proper joke here that had layers to it, everything. Got a couple of haha. But he just said some dumb shit and it's you not know, like that. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. But I kind of get that on Twitter now. Like I'm kind of like the popular kid mm. if I say something on my timeline. So it's just that really. It's just like shits and giggles. But that troll, right? So imagine, yeah, James, for three months, yeah, every single day, 10 probably tweets a day, at least five, yeah. Someone messaging you like long ones, like kind of half broken English, yeah. They're gonna come, they're gonna spy you. Darren Till as well, Molly, no, not not <laughs> I said that so we should let like, choke him out. Um just calling out those people, right? Didn't take it seriously. A couple of times I do with these people just to stop them tweeting. I go, oh, come to the gym tomorrow. There's a sparring session. Send a postcode. And I never turn up, obviously, yeah? The first time he said, oh, no, I need, a, I need some training. That's what he said. Okay. And I just ignored him for about three, three weeks. Then he started hounding me again, yeah? And I went, look, I'm sparring Friday. Come down. I'll pay for your, uh, your accommodation. I'll pay for your train ticket. I'll take you out for food after. And you know what I mean? Just to try and get off my back more than anything. You know what I mean, yeah. And if he was hell bent that he was coming, then fair enough, come to my boxing gym. I don't, like, I don't care. <laughs> People come to my boxing gym all the time. Um, anyway, so Friday come, he didn't come. He said he was ill. Um, Saturday, I wake up, my day off. I've got my kids. I wake up and at one point in the morning, I remember seeing a picture from this account, yeah. Linking a uh, train station on the platform. I have been from London to Sheffield countless times i was based here i went union sheffield as you can imagine gb whatever millions of times yeah i have never ever passed go and collect the 200 pound at lincoln ever never seen it so when i seen that at like 11 30 i just ignored it if you not he's just popping off making that he's on the way to sheffield about an hour and a half late i've just settled down I'm with my kids and i see a selfie from this kid and he's in my gym car park from london He's traveled all the way and he stood in my gym car park here. Yeah. And at this point, he's putting on there, and I've not seen it for like half an hour. So he stood there like 11 for half an hour, not getting no reply. So I've ghosted in his eyes, yeah. I've really just been driving back my kids from picking them up from their mums, you know what I mean, yeah. And I seen these there and I thought, nah, this kid's having me on, yeah. I was like, I, I replied. And I was like, I've got my kids. You know, I don't really need the environment. So we're going kids. Uh, and I thought, fuck it. I just put into the group chat. I'm going down to the gym right now. Meet me there, boys. A few boys went there, just obviously they one could open up and then they could have the kids and that. And he was there. And to be fair to him, he wasn't unpleasant. It was a bit he was a bit mad. But obviously anyone that travels four hours uninvited and then starts but you know what he was saying? Sorry, this is what he was saying. He was going, um, fifty pound for whoever's got Sonny as was address if he doesn't turn up to the gym. Tagging me and that. So my head's kind of gone, James. Like yeah, don't get me wrong. You don't know who, I don't know who it is. is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it could be a fucking the person it is. Psycho. But it could be like ten people. It could be yeah. like whatever. Like you, you actually don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't care because I like humans yeah, don't if fear you're fucking me. Kids, man, you yeah, of course, be of course, of course. But humans by nature don't fear me. They don't mm -hmm. scare me like um so I've got the thing kids in the car. I went down. And to be fair, like I said, he was all right. But yeah, when he said that about my address and he said that if I'm not there between 11 and 12, whatever he said, he's going to walk the whole of Sheffield screaming Sonny Edwards is a coward, yeah? Like, what am I actually supposed to do at this point? Am I just supposed to, like, ignore it? Am I just meant to block him? Like, someone has physically showed that they are willing to travel four hours mm -hmm. from London to Sheffield to see me. Like, I might as well deal with this now. He's talking about my address and that, like, I don't know what level of this could get to. So I went down there and I was agitated and I wanted him to feel that I was agitated. I pulled into the car park, jumped out of the car, you in the gym now. And I didn't know what to do. It was humming and ahhing, humming and ahhing. Come in, got him gloves, got him a head guard. He didn't want it. Mentioned mouth guard, he said he didn't need it. Protect, I didn't want it. All of that nonsense. Didn't want a head guard. I was like, okay, then I was going to take all mine off to match him. He said, no, 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 you keep all yours. And I was like, had my head guard off. And then, yeah, obviously he couldn't fight. Touched him a couple of times. And I wanted him to take one shot and quit. 
when I realised he wasn't going to do that, I thought, oh, let me tire him out. Let me scare him into being tired. Do you know what I mean? Let me faint and make out. I'm about to do loads of things and make his breathing just not be able to recover. And then what happened was, yeah, he did keep trying to keep throwing big shots. So when I made him miss with that last few, I hit him with that left hook. It wasn't a big shot. It was a slap. Do you know what I mean? It looked heavy though, mate. No, but look, where I, look, I look, but no, but look where I started. <laughs> yeah, I started. Like started it, I think no, but what I did is, yeah, I went at this, 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 this. And I started over here and I stopped. And I just went, bitch slap, do you know what yeah. I mean? That's what it was, but it like it, it probably had a bit more velocity, but it, but it was like a individual. Yeah, but it was like a little, do you know what I mean? And that's when I decided like fuck guys. Yeah, and then he was he went in. But do you know what it is though, yeah? It's what I think why I think that's gone like positively is because everyone that's in the public eye, especially like fighters, athletes, managers, anything, um, they have to deal with the the constant opinion, the bombardment of opinion. And when you're in like as a UFC fighter or or you're a boxer, the opinion isn't, oh, well, you can't kick a ball properly or you're fucking unfit or whatever. It's, oh, yeah, you're a bum. You'll get knocked out. You ain't got no chin. Like, sorry, my 17 years of boxing now and you're going to be just calling me that. Like, for some people, it's affecting them. For me, it's not because I think fucking, I think Wiley said it best is what Twitter is a playground for the idiots. You know yeah. what I mean? And genuinely, I believe that. Like, because the, the, the biggest idiots are the loudest ones in the room. But it's a great resource and a great tool to spread um, and to get information out there quickly. It's the best social media, I think, mm -hmm. um, for that. But yeah, so I've just got to put up with this all the time with just people bombarding me, turning up to my gym. Like, I'm a normal human being. I'm a normal human being the same way. And yeah, maybe I shouldn't have hit him at all. But I didn't hurt him. I didn't hurt him. Everyone knows I didn't hurt him. I didn't even put him down. I made sure I didn't put him down. I just kind of really, I wanted to oblige his wish. Like he really more than anything wanted to get in the ring with me. Fine, that's not that hard to organize. You know what I mean? Um, but I kind of just wanted to highlight the difference. Bear in mind, I am a five foot three and three quarters, depending on who you're asking. Um, Non-punching flyweight boxer. Right, so as you've done the grand scheme of things, I'm probably one of the the least intimidating or physically threatening or capable boxers that this country has. Okay, I'm very good, but like that, that and that was at twenty percent, thirty percent, and 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 okay, yeah, he didn't seem like much up to much. Okay, yes, I'm granted. There's definitely hundred and one thousand on London right now that could probably fight more than he could. I'm not suggesting not. But what I'm saying is, do you know, once I've spent 17 years doing this mm -hmm. range, watching you about to throw a shot, seeing that you go, and now I know a shot's probably coming from 17 years of that, James, of fighting, of being in a ring, of competing outside of that running. So my fitness is good training, press ups, all of that. Yeah. But people genuinely walk this off and believe in their physical prowess to a great deal because they've either watched boxing, hit a couple of bags, maybe had a straightener before and laid someone out. They will genuinely like look at a boxer that maybe lost a couple of times and think, oh, I'd have it with him. Like, and the level of delusion, like, is ridiculous. And okay, I had the same level of delusion with playing poker. Um, one of the boys, shout out, was at Brandon Williams' house, so shout out Brandon Williams. Um, one of the boys thought they could beat with his strong foot, Brandon at a penalty shootout with his weak foot. This kid can barely kick a ball with any foot. He can <laughs> barely throw a ball into a net, yeah? He's not a footballer, but he's convinced that, oh, but it's your left foot. How many times do you kick your left foot? He's a professional footballer that's been doing it since he's this knee holding. Yes, he can kick the ball with his left foot and his right foot. You know what I mean? But like that level of delusion, but that level of delusion would get him onto a football pitch. Mm -hmm. And then everyone laughs at him when he, he misses every penalty and whatnot. But the level of delusion that you show, whether you're physically challenging or, I don't know, AJ getting heckled or catcalled out of the university yeah, yeah. window. Like, okay, it's not right for any human and boxers probably should understand discipline to, to know their physical prowess and know the dangers that come with it. Yes. But you're still dealing with humans that have breaking points and snapping points. So if you're picking a boxer to be the person that you're you know, antagonizing or, or, or a jujitsu wrestler, I don't know how t t the, the thing is, or, or an MMA fight or any other sort of discipline where you train yourself every day to be a fighting machine. If you're outside of that demographic of people, like I wouldn't even believe in my fighting schools at all. 
like at all. If there's people out here that are dedicating their whole life to it, like, yeah, maybe I'm a bit tough. Maybe I can fight a shot, but I won't try to fight no one. There's people out here that can literally put you to sleep. There's people that can wrap you up like they yeah. switch your lights off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you're in a nightclub fucking thinking you're big, 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 big bollocks. Yeah. Like, I think it's mad. Like, I genuinely think it's mad. I don't like fights. I don't like physical confrontation at the, uh, the, the, um, the boxing gym or, or in the thing. I believe that duels should be allowed. I believe in this this day and age, I think if two men want to have a straightener or two people want to have a straightener, we live in an equal world, two women want to have a straightener of each other. I wouldn't like the cross ones, but I believe in duels, fair play, something like that, spars. What I don't believe in is, you know, advantages, sneaking up on someone, hitting them over the head with a bottle in a nightclub, all the scummy shit. Like, mm. I feel like maybe if there was some sort of way that when people have real disagreements, all right, let's go to the town hall and have a spa. You know what I mean? Yeah. Could you imagine? Shake hands after Shake that. hands. Because after you've had a fight with someone, no matter what, there's Mutual some respect. respect there. yeah. Like, and because I have existed from nine years old in a, most of my social groups for a long period of time, it was at school, it was at boxing. Anytime I had the boxing one, like you can usually kind of settle it you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. In a roundabout way, like, especially if they're near enough your weight, usually the only people you'd fall out with in boxing anyway, like you can settle it. So it's hard for a boxer to not be able to do anything about mm -hmm. anything. Anthony Joshua getting shouted at glass chin for a window. It's hard for him that he can't do nothing because the human in him, yeah? Like you see, if I came and disrespected you, James, and just said like, I don't know, some mad shit that you didn't even know that I would even have access to triggering you with, You'd want to slap me in the face. You'd want to hit me. You'd want to fucking strangle me. Who the fuck do you think you're talking to, you cheeky little prick? But why is it because someone's a boxer that they have to lose that? Yeah. Yeah, we should lose it. We should. We should not get drawn out. We should not uh, uh, risk our careers. But we are still human. And like, people think that, but, but it's mad. It's mad like the, how it juxtaposes for when they want to say it. Because all of a sudden, yeah, I've always been that anyone could beat me up. I get beaten up in uh, on the street by anyone that's a regular sized human that I can't punch. I can't do this. But then you probably have them same people that was watching that video going, I can't believe a professional boxer has even got in the ring with someone that's never had fighting experience. So hold on, which one is it? You can't win. Am I everyone? Mm -hmm. Can anyone walk down the street and put me in a headlock and put me in a bin? Or am I fucking dangerous to everyone? Everyone's got like, which one is it? Either I'm with you lot because we're all humans or now when it suits you, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm, my hands are dangerous weapons when it suits you. But it, it, it's not when you're commenting on, on my fights and saying I, I couldn't put a uh, fucking the Sandman to sleep. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, which win. one is it? Yeah. And because you can't win mm -hmm. and every time you get to anything, I think especially as like a public, like, when, when, when there's opinion, there will always be both sides of the opinion. No matter what you do, James, I could cure cancer tomorrow. And I guarantee someone will be like, why didn't you do it yesterday? Yeah. My auntie died, yeah. dickhead. But that's just the way, as that's the way of the world. But would but they not? Would they not? Everybody's got an opinion. It's like people fucking walking on water, they'll say it's because they can't swim. Like, it's just the way it is. Your mum and that must be proud of you though. Everything you've accomplished and where you've came from to what you're doing now. Like, one of the best boxers in Britain at the moment. Like, it's unbelievable what you're doing in 18 and 0. And just, I believe you're going to strive more for greatness. But with your mindset, and that's why these interviews are, are powerful because people get a better understanding of you because there's more layers to you than people who see on Twitter. After the people who might not watch boxing, but they'll still follow you on online because of the back and forth you have. Like, people get a better understanding. You know what? He's fucking very grounded. You're spot on. Like, for 26 years old, your mindset's, you're, you're bang on it, man. I can see that. I'm everything to do with well, energies and frequencies. I interview yeah. a lot of people, but I can see that, yeah, you've got something special. That your mum and that must be proud of everything you're accomplishing. Um, if it was up to my mum, we would never have had a pair of boxing gloves mm -hmm. on our hands. So I would love, obviously, she's not been well for a long period of time. The mum I've got now isn't the mum I grew up with in, in, in that sense. Um, but... Yeah, she would be proud of me achieving if I wanted to achieve, and she is proud. But, you know, it's incomparable me. I remember the first time she met Bobby, my youngest son, it was the same journey, my world title came down. I put them both there. What do you think she's looking at? Like, it's, it's worlds apart. Like, boxing to her, that IBF belt could be an international, it could be a British title, it could be a fucking Masters. Like, boxing to her, 
I'll be real. Never did. Never meant anything. If anything, she didn't want us to do it. I used to fight, say Liverpool, come back with the the the, the belt, the the trophy. I was a winner, medal, certificate, everything. Video. Oh, mum, watch it. Mom, no, I don't want to watch it. I don't want to watch it. I don't want to watch it. No, I don't want to watch it. Get her on. I've won. I'm not taking a shot. Sitting there crying. Turn it off. Couldn't yeah. watch her kids fight. Couldn't watch her boys fight. Didn't like it. Hated it, in fact. Um, so, yeah, I would love to say that my boxing has made my mum proud. I think me being a dad, me being a good one, would make her a lot prouder. I think me being happy, me somehow paving out a way where I've not had to call no one boss my whole life. I don't come from money. I don't have mysterious benefactors. When I came back from Spain for a year, I lived in a old care home that was waiting to get pulled down, shared with about seven or eight slightly odd different individuals, had my own two little rooms, £190 a month, had to pay for my own internet, shared kitchen. That was my first year or second year as a pro professional boxer, living up in Sheffield, 30, 40 minutes away from the gym, I was getting buses. Like I struggled, like... Like genuinely, I could guarantee, yeah, I'm going to try and find it because I've just, for every reason, it's made me think of it. I'm going to try and find a little video that will show you how I lived in about 10, 15 seconds. And you tell me the fighters that would have left the fucking luxury apartment in Marbella, yeah, and moved into this fucking old care home that had insects coming out of everywhere, fucking single glazed windows, um, fucking them little silver things, like a madness. But I lived there for a year just to set up and be where I needed to be for my boxing at 21 years old. I was going to a place, I couldn't even bring girls unless I'd known them for more than three years. I couldn't bring a new girl there, do you know what I mean? It was mad. <laughs> they had to know me. I had a tapestry hanging up with a finger on yeah. to block the that place actually, because where I put my belt and me being stupid, that actually faded off my belt. My, my ABA belt, it faded the top half and the, the bottom half is not. And I gave it to Grant, yeah. And it's just like, for somehow that's like symbolic to me. I don't know what it means. Mm -hmm. But it's like the transition. It's like the gray, like the, the grayish red to the bright red at the bottom. Give it to him. It's in his office now. But no. that place there, I could, I, I couldn't tell you the people that would live there. I, 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 I would not be able to tell you fighters that would live there. And I lived there calm. One hundred ninety pound a month. My bills all in. Yeah. Uh, where do you go for the future, brother? What's the plans? The world, moon, stars above it. I think it's all within my reach. I think my um, potential my achievements that I can reach are all laid out right in front of me. I think all I've got to do is perform. Um, I think I've managed to captivate an audience to a slight um, position where even with losses, bad performances, I think I'll still have a, a, a name, but that's not in my thinking. I think genuinely, genuinely, I beat Martinez. I think I make the fight with Bam Rodriguez, whether it's after or next, that's a massive fight. And then I go to Japan and try and fight um, Nakatani on New Year's, he's on my birthday. One, yeah. He's number one, but I don't know how, if I'm honest. He's not fought no one. He's, he's fought a couple of decent, no world champions. I beat the number one who'd been number one for well over a year, was made number two. Martinez was number one. Nakatani was number three. I've then defended it twice. Um, and at some point I got dropped to three. And at some point Martinez, I think when he lost to Roman Gonzalez, then got dropped to number two. And then that, so it's, it's all a bit over the place at the moment, isn't it? So number one, number two, number three, I don't really think you can be pulling us apart. I'm the only one I think that's beat a world champion. Yeah. For anybody that's watching that's maybe struggling right now in life, what advice would you have for them? Life's not as tough as it seems. It's the toughest, it's the toughest thing in the world, but it's never as tough as it seems. I think at any given time, something can be the best or worst. Um, and because you only have one mindset at the time, it's very easy to get so engulfed and encapsulated into one event, one series of unfortunate ones. Like It's so easy to let one new thing happen, take over your life. And I think it's very important to to remind yourself that how long you spent becoming the person you are can't be writ off by just one thing, two things, three things. Like, you know, we are just lost souls trying to find it through this walk of life. And yeah, don't be too hard on yourself. Yeah. I think it's just, you know, people get caught up on things. And that's so uh, the reason why it sounds kind of so specific is because there's things and conversations going around now. I think there's something in the air, James. I think something in the last week, two weeks, I think... I don't know if it's just me. A lot of mad things have been going on in people's lives, like quite just 
uncharacter things. I think it's been a bit of a mad one recently. Yeah. Why that is, I don't know. Maybe it's just me and who what the conversation I've been having. But yeah, I think, you know, if you make mistakes in this season of the hot weather, climate change and yeah, just do better and be better. Don't beat yourself up. For coming on today, brother. James, telling your story. I thoroughly enjoyed Thank that you. world class fighter, mate. I look forward to seeing what you do in the future. Hopefully you get this fight in Mexico, mate, and you can shine even more. God bless you, brother. I appreciate it, bro.